So our last talk of this session will be from Brzezlob Maslowski talking about probabilistic predictive capability. Okay. Um, good morning still, or good afternoon. Uh, I'll try to not to keep you over time uh, before lunch. So uh, I'm not going to go into all the details that I, I could, uh, but uh, uh, I'll try my best. And uh, I think that what I'm hearing from Elizabeth, I wasn't here on my, on Tuesday, which I apologize for. I had another meeting, but it looks like we're making a, a whole turn around. So Elizabeth started with uh, a question about uh, the feasibility of using size model type climate model uh, for sea ice or sea ice model for climate status interoperational. I'm just giving an example of uh, potentially using that particular model for operational or semi-operational prediction. So I wanted to acknowledge my uh, colleagues on the team. It's just basically, we call it RASM team, Regional Arctic System Model. We've been working together over 12 years now, mostly supported by Department of Energy. Uh, a lot of uh, funding also from Office of Neural Research, and we couldn't do anything without the computational resources that we're leveraging from the Department of uh, Defense High Performance Computing Modernization Program. So uh, just a, a very a brief one slide overview of the model. Uh, we're using a regional model, which is a, a equivalent of a Earth system model. So it has all the components, the atmospheric components, the CS component, the, the ocean component, the land hydrology. We also have the marine biogeochemistry, both in sea ice and the ocean. Everything is uh, 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 tied together by the flux coupler. And uh, the model configuration that we're using, most of the results I'll be talking about is 50 kilometer land and ocean, land and atmosphere, 112 of 99 kilometer rotated coordinate system for uh, sea ice and ocean. Uh, we have individual components for atmosphere and land at 25 kilometer and 2.4 kilometer for the land and uh, uh, ice and ocean. However, we haven't done the coupling and the, the evaluation of that model yet. This is still things to be done. The very important part is that for the regional model, it's a regional domain, so we need to have a lot of abundant conditions. And because it's a regional model, we cannot resolve the planetary scale wavelength in the atmosphere, for example. So we need to have the uh, nudging in the upper atmosphere to represent the large scale that cannot be accounted for in the regional, uh, uh, regional atmospheric model. So what we do is just we take either the reanalysis as a boundary condition for hindcast, or we take the output from the Earth system model like CSM uh, to drive the future scenario and study this type of uh, uh, work. Very important uh, uh, take home message is that we're not using any data simulation. We're not doing any bias corrections. So all the results are here are raw results. We're not hiding anything. And uh, the very important part is that uh, because we're emphasizing the, the fidelity in the model physics, instead of correcting with data simulation or bias correction, uh, we get to the point that our initial condition that we can use for forecasting or prediction are physically consistent across all the components, or at least most of them. Okay. And another thing is that because we are forcing, like here, when we do Heinkastra analysis, when we are forcing with analysis, we can use a model, results from this model, to compare against observations in space and time. You cannot do that with the Earth system model. You can only do statistical analysis or comparison. So with that, I'll go right away into the uh, advertising the, the, uh, our, our operational capability. There's a website publicly available. It's not just only for the Navy. Go there. And if you go to 2022 September initialized forecast, the model ensemble mean based on 31 ensemble is the blue. We started in uh, on September 1, and we forecast all the way to the end of September 23 now. Six months forecast every month, and roughly on the order of 30 ensemble members. Uh, the red Dots are actual observations from NSIDC, and they're being updated on a daily basis. So according to what I looked at the uh, NSIDC, the minimum, daily minimum in CI610 for 2022 uh, was reached on uh, 16 September, and the number is 4.65 million square kilometer. Okay, and that's the last dot, well, the lowest dot here. The Rassam ensemble mean for September 16, it's 4.665. So 
And if you look at the dots, the red dots and the, the, the blue line, you can say like, okay, we're done. Thank you very much. We can just finish and retire. Well, it's too easy. Uh, if you go, another aspect, if you go back all the way six months to predict September, so now we're looking at our earlier forecast initialized in, on April 1, which covers the end of September, six months forward, you can see it actually with a six months forecast, we're not doing that much worse. Actually, very good. We had some biases in the uh, initial conditions, which I can explain. But in the end, September 16, the forecast from ensemble mean was 4.86 compared to 4.665. So I would argue that this is a very important uh, result because we're showing that we can do more than seasonal prediction at equivalent scale to what you can do at subseasonal with this with this capability. Okay, uh, you can go, go back and look at the uh, model performance of CI6 stand uh, for, let's say, last decade. So starting 2012, 2012 to 2021. Sorry, this is 2021. And the lines here are different color lines, solid color lines are different data sets. So the, the green is Aussie SAF. NASA team is this kind of like uh, um, uh, cyan. The red is uh, uh, um, bootstrap. Thank you. <laughs> I remember that for a long time. Climate data record is this purple, and the model climatology for twenty for ten years is this kind of like uh, 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 orange dashed line. The six model lines are three in black and three in blue, uh, solid dashed and dotted are different initial uh, time period forecasts, okay? So if you look at the 2012, this is focused on September uh, from, you know, plus minus 30 days or 15 days. And look at the, uh, where the, uh, the, the, those lines here, the black and the, 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 the blue lines, sometimes you do much, much better, sometimes not so much. For example, 2021, we're underestimating uh, most of the uh, observation estimates. But if you look at the previous year, actually the spread in observational estimates is the same as spread in our six uh, monthly forecasts. Okay, so that's another way to eventually uh, uh, analyze. I have results that I can show you in terms of the uh, Taylor diagram, the, the uh, statistical analysis, and the model skill that typically are being done. Uh, I don't have time to discuss this, so I'm going to go to something else. Okay, so we have perfect or very good skill in forecasting CI6 CI extent number. But now if you look at the observed September 16 from the NSIDC and our uh, ice concentration, you can see that this is not perfect. There are quite differences. For example, the East Siberian Tongue, which is present, very low concentration, but still present. We have a very tiny hint of it, and most of it is gone. Uh, the other thing is that uh, there's more ice in the kind of like south, southeastern Beaufort Sea, or maybe we don't have this embayment kind of like in the central Beaufort Sea, and we might not have this embayment between the Laptev and the East Siberian Sea. The number is right, but the spatial pattern is not necessarily that good or not perfect, right? So uh, the take home message I'm trying to communicate is that actually CS prediction is not a good uh, metric for evaluating models, okay? I know that this is a very common and very useful thing because we have data set going or time series going back to 40, 50 years, but you have to keep in mind that that's not necessarily uh, the only thing that you should be looking at in validating models. So what people commonly do is they, they look at the actual displacement uh, in spatial pattern. So uh, it's called ice edge integrated, uh, ice ed integrated ice edge error, IIEE. -E. And uh, we have a paper published where we uh, basically focus on a CIMIP-6 model uh, IIE analysis, but uh, we're also showing the uh, IIE from the uh, rasm hindcast So if you look at the rasm hindcast actually it's much better than any CIMIP-6, so that's a good news. But if you look at the summertime, the melt season, we go all, all the way up to 1.5 million square kilometer uh, uh, IIE error compared to observations, so that's a lot. Uh, winter time, the, the, the cold season actually is pretty good, order of 0.5 uh, million square kilometer, which I would argue that's uh, within the range of uncertainty uh, of observational estimates from the satellites. 
So we have a problem in the, in the summertime, wintertime is good. And the other message is that uh, using the uh, downscaling uh, with reanalysis, uh, we actually uh, do much better than any CMIP uh, type model in terms of uh, a globally fully coupled model, okay? Another thing that you could do is actually look at specific at the time, you know, like snapshot time analysis and look at the overestimated areas and amount and the underestimated. And this is being done for a snapshot of July 1, 2019. And you can actually see that a lot of errors in winter, or sorry, this is, this is summer or, or melting season, it's associated with the uh, marginalism. So I've been actually enjoying uh, listening to all these talks for the past two days uh, about the, the problems and the ways to improve physics in the model uh, in terms of marginal I zone. But uh, I'll show you some additional result, uh, results that are saying that maybe that's not only that it's just flow size distribution and the wave uh, uh, propagation into the ice that might be driving the, the errors in those particular regions uh, for, for our model. So uh, we can also look at the, this kind of skill analysis, uh, comparing the integrated ice edge error against the, at least like climatology, which is the solid black line. And I'm circling the regions where model initialized in summer or late summer actually are beating the climatology. So that's already some kind of like a promise that uh, this is a useful tool to use for potential applications uh, if we can beat the climatology with those forecasts. And also during the winter time, we also have some skill potentially, but not during the, the melt season and during the summertime. Okay. So uh, you can look at uh, one particular problem, for example, in the Greenland Sea, and we have the Odin, which is not present in the observations, which are represented by the, the green line here, 15% uh, NSIDC uh, estimate here. You can see that we're doing relatively well, except this Odin, which, is, which happens to be very thin ice, like order of uh, 10, 20 centimeter of, of ice. So it's not like a big error because if we could uh, deliver a little more energy, we can probably get rid of this. And that might be associated with the recirculation of the uh, West Pittsburghian current into the East Greenland current and basically interacting with this. It could be flow size distribution and wave attenuation as well. I don't know, we don't have the flow size. But what we can do, we can play some uh, sensitivity studies and change some parameters in the model, and we can get rid of it without a flow size distribution. So there is, an, uh, there is a way to eventually do some sensitivity study with this kind of model, because we can actually, uh, having the lateral boundary condition, we can, uh, uh, we can do some testing with the lateral boundary conditions or parameter space to see whether we can get rid of some of the biases. And those are local biases related to the ice, uh, ice extent error, okay? Another thing that is very important is that if you look at the nine kilometer, this is the ice ocean nine kilometer, you can see those errors that uh, or biases in the Greenland Sea, uh, north of Iceland Sea, uh, maybe in the Sea of Okotsk in the wintertime and in the summertime, very commonly this kind of tongue of ice, which we actually have here compared to observations, this year, it was the opposite. There was a tongue from observations, but we didn't get it, okay? So this is a nine kilometer result. And if I go to the two kilometer results that I mentioned earlier, all those, or most of those biases actually disappear. So there's an argument to make that with the edge resolution in the ocean, with the uh, uh, better high resolution in the sea ice in terms of probably representing some of the deformation fields, we can actually improve uh, the skill in the model in terms of some of the biases that we diagnose. Okay, so now we can think about uh, ice extent, but ice extent is the only, not, not the, the issue, as I mentioned, and we argue that ice thickness is a much important uh, uh, metric to evaluate the model. The problem is that we don't have that much data on the ice thickness. There is a promising, uh, you know, developments, ISAT2, uh, previously Cryosat2 as well and the uh, EM uh, uh, estimates, as well as the in situ measurements. So what we've done here, for example, is that uh, we've looked at the ISAT uh, comparison um, with RASM, and I'm showing also the PIOMAS, the commonly used the reanalysis uh, from University of Washington. And I'm just showing that compared to uh, ISAT, when you take the difference between RASM, Heinkast, and the ISAT uh, for a uh, five years uh, mean in March, 
the, the difference between Rasm and ISAD is very similar to one between Biomas and, and Triasa. The ISAT, sorry. And keep in mind that ISAT has some uncertainty in estimates of ice thickness as well. We can do a scatter plot between the cryosat as well. So this is the cryosat uh, scatter plot for 2010, 2014 for winter months. This is the scatter plot for Rasm against the cryosat. This is the same thing done for Payama. So actually, if you look closer, we could argue that Rasm is maybe doing even better compared to cryo cryosat 2. Uh, than, than the uh, comparison showing here for pyomas, at least not worse. So thickness, uh, what we've done here, what I'm showing you an example is that initial condition related to the thickness. We use NSEP to drive our hindcast from 1979 all the way until we initialize the model. So every time we run a six months forecast, 30 ensemble member, we update our hindcast by one month more with the ANSEP analysis. And we use that as initial conditions for 30 ensemble members to run six months forecast forward, okay? So this is a case showing for April 1, 2017. This is the CFSR ANSEP reanalysis ice thickness on that day. And this is RASM, which is using ANSEP reanalysis to force the hindcast to create the April 1, 2017 initial conditions. So you can see the benefit of downscaling with the regional model where we get this ice thickness distribution on April 1, 2017 compared to that, which is clearly unrealistic. And I'm showing a composite from Kyosat for uh, a time period around that, uh, that uh, initial date, which is uh, showing a much closer resemblance with the Rassam initial thickness uh, distribution rather than the CFSR, okay? Very important aspect here is that the Rassam reduces biases uh, uh, due to the uh, increased model fidel fidelity. We have high resolution. We have uh, physics optimized uh, for the Arctic. And it represents gains in terms of realistic ice thickness distribution, which translates into the initial conditions, okay? So now if I go to the next slide, the top is my previous slide results. This is CFSR on April 1 initial condition. This is Rasm, and this is that uh, cryosat for comparison. And we're looking what we did, what, what, what everybody did for the uh, September uh, prediction. So this is the NCEP CFS V2. Those are uh, forecasts based on this initial condition uh, for September 2017. So that's like uh, uh, five months later. This is Rasm using that forcing from CFS V2 to drive our ensemble members, and this is an ensemble mean thickness distribution. And this is the estimate from uh, Cryosat starting uh, for uh, uh, 15, uh, 15 September through uh, 1st of uh, December, uh, October, very first part of the uh, next, next winter uh, Cryosat estimates. So you can see that initial conditions that uh, 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 were present in CFSR carried over for six months into the forecast. Same thing in Rasm, we had much better initial conditions for ice thickness, and we had much better forecast. And that's in much better agreement between uh, Rasm and Cryosat 2 than the uh, forcing that we're using both for hindcast and the forecast. Okay, so what we can do also, we can do some kind of sensitivity studies, and I've showed uh, some of uh, those results, not exactly this result, but I've uh, showed results on the difference in the rheology for initial conditions, okay? And what I'm showing here is that if you run a same model, Rassam, Heinkast, and the only thing you change is rheology, which size uh, has an option, just simply you switch from EVP to EAP, okay? So the left, the left is EAP, the, the middle one is the EVP. And we run the model from 1979 through um, uh, September 15, 2019, okay? The EAP produces thicker ice in general compared to EVP. If you calculate the difference, this is a, a difference between the two uh, for that time period. Roughly half a meter difference in ice thickness throughout the central Arctic. Okay, this is showing the forecast from initialized on uh, um, July 1, six months forward, uh, a number of uh, um, results, uh, ensemble mean in purple being for uh, EAP and the cyan being for EVP. And you can see that uh, 
uh, sea ice extent and concentration don't differ that much between the two rheology. But if you compare ice volume, which is determined by thickness, the ice thickness and volume difference persists for the whole six months of the simulation and forecast. So one take home message from here is that if you have initial conditions that are wrong, that will affect your six months forecast out into the six months at least. And the other, the other thing again, which I mentioned before, is the CI6 stand is not necessarily that good metric to uh, use for uh, evaluating model skill because you have, in both cases for two rheology, you have very similar uh, ice extent. Okay. So now we're looking at the uh, end of six months forecast, basically to uh, uh, emphasize the message that if you run for six months from initial conditions and your initial conditions were uh, different by order of half a meter throughout the central Arctic, six months later with your forecast, you keep the same difference between the two ensemble member forecasts. Okay, more evaluation of the ice thickness. So I'm getting now to the point that like, we need data. We need ice thickness observations. And we've done, uh, Klaus Datlow from Avi and myself and a, a number of people uh, on the mosaic team, we've looked at the mosaic data and we try to understand the, the ice thickness uh, observations uh, relative to the, the RASM ice thickness estimates. So there was a, a, a Captain Dranitsin who went uh, to exchange a crew and they were coming back and they were doing a lot of uh, uh, jamming uh, to go through the thick ice, but at the same time, they provided estimates uh, uh, of the ice thickness. So there's a comparison of the in situ from Granitsin on board and the RASM ice thickness along those uh, uh, track marked by those dots, dots. And you can see that in the color coding, uh, the uh, in situ and the background color shading is RASM. Same thing in this scatter plot here. We're kind of like showing that we're off by order of 0 0.4, 0 0.5 meter in thickness estimates. But um, um, I forgot the name. But anyway, uh, the guy who is uh, doing EM. Uh, uh, thank you, Christian Haas. Christian Haas was co-author on the paper and we communicated with him this results and asked him for a comment. And this is his comment. The ship-based estimates are biased because of this hamming going back and forth. And the actual estimates from EM and the satellites are more in agreement with Rasen. So this is a case that for me, there's a, 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 a quote that I remember, cannot remember the, the, the source, but there's a quote saying, nobody believes the model except the author. Everybody believes the, uh, the, the data except the author. Okay, this is the case that I would argue that it's a very good case, okay? Anyway, uh, we've done some more stuff uh, with the, with the um, TriSat 2 uh, SMOS estimates, uh, which are shown at the top. Uh, sorry, this is, this is that way. Uh, TriSat 2 SMOS, RASM, and uh, the difference... Uh, uh, between, between them, CI thickness differences. So if you look at the uh, Cryosat 2 estimates for November and January, and RASM November and January, monthly means, and the difference, you can see that, you know, we're order of maybe in the half a meter difference for the whole Arctic comparing to Cryosat uh, SMOS. Uh, however, keep in mind the Cryosat uncertainty is order of uh, more than half a meter. I'm not saying that this is the argument that Rasm is doing better than Cryosat. I'm just saying that Cryosat 2 comes with its own uh, uncertainty. If you look at uh, specific, you know, like the mean standard deviation and so forth between the Cryosat 2 SMOS, for example, at the end of the winter, the mean ice thickness was 1.61 for the Rasm was 1.63. The standard deviation was 0.77 for Cryosat 2 SMOS and was 0.61 for Rasm. So I would argue that it's not perfect. You can clearly see the differences between Cryosat 2 and Rasm, but those are pretty decent results. And uh, this is showing, uh, looking at the um, um, anomalies uh, relative to the 10 year mean ice thickness uh, uh, from Cryosat 2 SMOS shown on the at the top for January, November, January, February, March, and the bottom is for Rasm. So this is a special maps to, to show that the anomaly distribution between the observational estimates and the model for
for that particular winter are in quite good agreement. And this is further supported by the uh, scatter plots. Uh, this is showing, I believe this is showing uh, November and this is showing January uh, a scatter plot uh, between the Chrysler II SMOS and the RASM. Okay, I'll uh, say that it's not only thickness because also dynamics in the model, the, the momentum forcing from the atmosphere on sea ice and the ocean is very important. And that winter, the mosaic winter, started in November from highly negative uh, AO index and became most uh, one of the most extreme uh, positive AO during the same winter time. So that was a very interesting case because it was an extreme case from going from highly negative AO to extremely positive AO and how this affects the system in the Arctic since we are having those observations. The first thing is that the positive AO phase during January, March 2020 uh, related to cold surface temperature, reduced sea level pressure and enhanced near surface wind anomalies, which explain the transpolar drift acceleration and uh, the faster than, than uh, expected mosaic uh, uh, ice load drift, which ended up getting them out uh, in uh, July or, or so, uh, out into Fram Strait, okay? That translates into accelerated uh, transpolar drift in terms of the sea ice drift. The left panel is showing the difference in the um, um, RASM results compared to a uh, uh, 10 year mean before ice drift and the Aussie soft, same comparison. Uh, the color shading is the, the, the magnitude, the vectors are just kind of like standardized vectors to represent the transpolar drift. You can see actually how uh, transpolar drift accelerated during that winter relative to the 10 year before and agreement between the Aussie soft estimates and the RASM. Okay, I'll be wrapping up in a couple minutes. Uh, important thing is that now we're uh, also tried part of the Hyla Rasm uh, project. Uh, we've uh, we've uh, used the uh, CSM, the kill prediction initialized results to force our downscaling in Rasm. Okay, and we've run simulations between 1955 to 2025. I'm showing here a case of an ensemble member uh, starting uh, in uh, 2000 through 2009. This is showing at the top, this is showing the um, uh, ice area. The blue is the CSM ice area ensemble mean. The red is the RASM. The dashed black line is the NSIDC mean for that time period. So you can see that we're using now CSM atmospheric output to drive the RASM uh, ensemble members. And because we initialize the model with the RASM initial conditions, not the CSM, we can carry that thing for 10 years and maybe not necessarily area, but the, the more important thing is that uh, in terms of ice thickness and volume, uh, we're comparing against biomass. So that's the only thing that we can compare. Uh, the CSM started very similar to RASM in terms of uh, uh, ice thickness and ice volume. But after 10 years, you can see a clearly a drift, which is also diagnosed in the atmospheric uh, fields by our colleagues here. And RASM maintains uh, roughly the same difference between uh, red RASM and the Pyomas in dash black uh, for the 10 year period. So that can be further exemplified in terms of comparing maps between CSM and RASM for the first month of the uh, 10 year period in the ensemble 2016, 2025, where you can see that CSM ice thickness is thinner in January, 2016 than RASM. When you go to September first year uh, of that simulation, almost all ice is being gone in CSM compared to RASM. When you go 10 years later summer, the CSM has increased the thickness in the ice in the summertime, while this RASM is showing a, a slight uh, gradual decline. So the argument here I'm trying to make, this is not a robust result, this is just a one case, but we have based on CSM, DPLE, decadal uh, dynamic and downscaling, we have indication that initial ice thickness distribution might be important not only for six months, might be important up to 10 years. Okay, so in summary, uh, I just uh, hope that you have seen at least some results that uh, are suggested that we have a semi-operational uh, fully coupled model for uh, CS prediction. And uh, the argument uh, I've been trying to make is that the dynamic downscaling 
using a fully coupled uh, uh, regional model provides benefits of higher resolution, polar optimized physics, and the computational costs are actually significantly uh, uh, less or more affordable to run uh, optimization and ensembles. Uh, the, uh, the approach allows physically consistent initial conditions, and uh, those conditions appear to be relevant up to the cable time scale. And uh, this model is readily available for further improvements, the flow size distribution, wave watch, and so forth. Uh, if anybody is interested, let me know, especially if, if you bring your funding with it, <laughs> would be useful. And uh, it demonstrates, the, the, the approach demonstrates potential for uh, improved predictive skill of relevance to uh, a wide uh, spectrum of stakeholders in the Arctic. Because if we're talking about uh, providing the uh, predictions of time scale six to six months to 10 years, uh, we've been uh, currently uh, uh, in regular basis communicating with the US National Ice Center, as well as, for example, we were providing very detailed per request customized uh, information for the de deployment of the 2022 uh, winter ISEX uh, uh, submarine uh, uh, base uh, uh, experiment. And we, we plan to do the same thing. So I'll stop here and uh, thank you very much. Take any questions. Okay, thanks very much. So we'll just pick a couple of quick questions and then we'll... Hi, Vizla. Uh, recently in Nature, there was a paper that was published and they were showing a satellite image showing like a warm coastal current along the Alaskan coastline, breaking off at Point Barrow and then wandering over the Chukchi Plateau, exactly where you had this dent in your sea ice extent. And I was wondering, does, well, are you running 148 or 112, what we saw here? And do you see those kind of penetration of warm Pacific water in your kind of so, basin? We've been looking at this in this particular area for a while now. Uh, we, do, we do have a coastal current. We have a very warm coastal current delivering very warm water along the Alaskan coast, uh, uh, Barrow Canyon into the Southern Beaufort Sea. Uh, it, it doesn't make a, a much difference in our case, at least. Uh, I've seen coarse resolution models. I think GFDL model has this embayment, uh, and they are much closer resolution model. My my initial guess is that uh, the shell basin eddy uh, field transport, in terms of heat or or fresh water or momentum as well, uh, is diffused even at at nine ten kilometer. I don't know what happens in a GFDL, for example, that they get it right, but. <clears throat> I've, we've looked at the uh, uh, forced ice ocean simulations with a 2.4 kilometer, and many of those biases that we've seen along the perimeter, summer or winter, are uh, significantly improved with the with the uh, better representation of eddies. So that's my first guess. Um, there are papers. Uh, I think uh, Mike Spall and, and and colleagues they published uh, kind of like more idealized simulations where they showed that uh, the eddy field uh, uh, transport across the shell break in the Central Arctic. It's critical to communicating the, the signal from the shelf to the basin. So that's another uh, reason to, to believe that that's the case. Uh, but I would still argue, listening to the talks uh, for the past couple of days, that uh, improved representation of the marginal ice zone, for example, and wave uh, uh, penetration might be another reason that uh, this, is, this is not working. Again, I haven't, don't have an explanation why coarse resolution like GFDL models, SPEAR, somehow get that feature, but uh, that may be something uh, that uh, Mitch Bushuk or somebody else can answer. Yeah, you showed some very impressive results on the seasonal time scale. Um, I, I wonder, given that, of course, the atmosphere has an impact on the sea ice evolution, and um, the atmosphere is chaotic after 10 days, so we don't know precisely how the atmospheric conditions will be, and this will always be a limiting factor on the sea ice predictions. Um, I wonder whether you have to reach now with a model the limit, was this possible, or do you think there is still some, some, some room for improvements? Definitely there is room for improvements. Um, I'm not sure if I understood your first part of, the, of, the, of your point, but uh, uh, the way we're doing this, we're not f using the global atmospheric winds at the surface. Our lower half of the atmosphere is freely re evolving because it's a coupled model. So we have the ladder boundary condition from the atmosphere along the atmospheric domain ladder boundary conditions. No, I, 
Yeah, I understand this. Well, my point is we, we can't never predict the Z as perfectly, even if a model is perfect, because oh, we don't yeah. know in reality what the atmosphere is. Well, doing. so my so point is that the uncertainty from the atmosphere, I, chaotic show, behavior yeah. of the atmosphere. No? I've shown what we what we can get now. I think there is still room for improvements if we improve the specific processes, especially uh, you know that be, can be diagnosed with this uh, uh, ice uh, integrated ice extent error, for example. Especially focusing on particular places, and those those places and those, those biases that show up there during particular season, during the particular uh, uh, in a particular place, are pointing to some problems in the model in terms of physics fidelity, in my opinion. So for example, the, the example that I've showed you with the Odin in the Greenland Sea, we believe that it relates to the amount of recirculating uh, warm Atlantic water being underestimated. And that's why uh, there is a, a 10 or 20 centimeter uh, thin ice uh, leave, left uh, uh, in, the, in this Odin feature uh, in the model, which is not showing in the in the observations, at least not in the recent time. There was Odin observations in the past as well. So, so but the main thing is that when, when I look at, at, at model results and I see a bias which is related to a 20 centimeter ice thickness, the, the changes that are required in terms of some improvements are, are small, very small. You know, you, how, much, how much energy we need to melt 20 centimeter of ice. So answering your question, uh, Observational estimates are uncertain, as I've shown, at least some of them, okay. Uh, in terms of ice thickness, we're still uh, hoping to get uh, a better uh, correction on the uh, freeboard estimates from ISA 2 as well as the CRISA 2. But in the end, uh, the idea is that um, when you compare, I guess, observations, your model, doesn't matter how uncertain are observations, and you can still show that the model has biases, there's room for working on those biases and improving those biases. That's, that's the way I see it. Okay, great. Thanks Thank very you. much. Um, so we're going to draw the formal questions to a close now. If anybody does have any other questions, please do follow up at lunch. And I'm just going to hand the baton over to Danny to make a few additional words. Thanks, Andrew. I'll keep this short, okay, because I know you want to get something to eat. Um, I thought the, I just wanted to make a few final remarks. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed this week and found it helpful. Uh, I can only say that I certainly have. Okay, I've had a great time. I hope that you've also had a good time. Okay, um, the the talks have been live streamed. They will also be uploaded and available for download later. Again, if you have a problem with that, let us know. Okay, the posters. There's also a possibility to upload posters. Okay, so you'll get an email about this, and you can decide whether you want to have your posters on the website as well. Okay, so that might be a nice resource for some people. Um, speaking about the online community, we have actually had a few people specifically say thank you. Okay, so uh, I got an e a nice email from Hayley Shen, okay, saying how she was really grateful for this workshop and able to attend virtually. So beyond this room, people are actually benefiting from this. So that, that's nice. Okay. Um, this is week one, okay? There's another week. Uh, I realize that, uh, that most of you will not be going to that second week, okay? But there will be another week of, of talks uh, about the industrial and engineering aspects. So that's something to look forward to. Even if you can't come in person, there'll be online talks and you can participate in that, okay? Um, but I know many of you are leaving right now, which is why I wanted to say, say thanks and goodbye, essentially. Okay, so I'd like to thank the INE staff for helping to make this work, okay? Yeah, I'd probably particularly highlight a Charlotte who helped with the, the like the pre-organisation, okay, and Nathan who's done a lot of running around, okay, dealing with the audio-visual thing. So yeah, he's giving me the thumbs up. It's great for that, okay. Um, but I guess the, the main thing I want to thank is you lot, okay. This wouldn't have been possible if you hadn't turned up. So I'd like to thank you for your energy, enthusiasm, and if I can quote Danny Dumont, okay, your collective human intelligence, okay, <laughs> okay, uh, to, to, to bring that, make, make this workshop be a successful fun time, for me at least, okay. So I know that some of you are going to lunch now, but I just want to say goodbye and safe traveling for traveling now. Okay, thank you. <laughs>